All right, here we are. Welcome back. We got some more standard for you. We're gonna have Brian Kibler. He's gonna be going off, go. going off against Brian, um, Tom Martell. I'm at 18 life points. Brian David Marshall. I'm Shot Miller. Why don't you tell us what type here. of decks we're gonna yep. see here and what's gonna be going on in these matches? Yep. So Tom Martell is gonna utterly destroy uh, Talon Agent's office, and uh, Brian Kibler, you know, he's gonna play Naya. That's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly I, what's going to happen. I didn't even need to ask you. So, and we got a couple of turns going on here. We have Tar Martell. He got a couple of land and a Doom Traveler. So it looks like he's on the uh, Sam Black deck. The Aristocrats. Yep, the Aristocrats. He just followed it up with a, a High Priest. And two mana from Brian Kibler is going to give us a Mizium Mortars. Get rid of that. He, he knows gotta, to get that Skiers deck High Priest the hell out of here. Yeah, I mean, that that guy just looks like a 1-2 that never activates his ability, but <clears throat> Brian Kibler knows better. So back to Tom Martell. Life totals 19-16 to 16 in Brian Kibler's favor. Feels almost a, a little uh, like a coming out party for Mizium Mortars. We're seeing a lot of it uh, like traveler, right now, and just as this very flexible removal spell. Yeah. You know, just like, now. boom, get rid of that, you know, four <laughs> damage. Really by four the damage way, is a lot of damage. But, by all by the way, that's, uh, yeah, four damage you know, basically just destroys target creature and just the upside of being able to destroy all of your okay. opponent's creatures. Yeah. Uh, that was a double striking Doom Traveler. 17. I heard double uh, striking double Doom Traveler from a Silver Blade Paladin. Oh, no. wow. That's that's quite the pairing. That's going to get in two damage. So Brian Kepler is going to go down to 17. That was the answer. Go. Uh, and it boils Reckoner. Amanda. Orzov Charm is going to get rid of the boils Reckoner. Tom Takes, Martell is going to lose three. <laughs> Takes but, three anyway. Yeah. That, <laughs> man, that boils Reckoner, it gets his damage you, in you know one what? way or another. You're, you're pretty happy to sort of thump your chest and yes. say, I'll take three to kill that. Yeah. What you don't want is take that Silver Blade Paladin, no. take, or, or the Silver Blade Paladin taking that three. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is which is what would happen with a yeah. uh, red yep. removal spell. Definitely. And there was attack with both creatures for Tom Martell that was going to bring Brian Kibble down to 11. His follow-up, Loxodon Smiter. 4-4 four, four for three mana. So let's take a look at uh, what's going on in Brian Kibler's hand here. Well, there's a, there's a gate crash card yep. for you. Gore Clan Rampager. And we got a nice collection of land. A pretty interesting Naya collection. We got all the <laughs> colors over there. About, like, like if I told you there were three lands in Brian Kepler's <laughs> hand, like, <laughs> you might say stomping ground. Well, you but, definitely have to say forest. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is definitely forest. And we're looking at Tom Martell hand. And he has a cartel aristocrat, falcon rat. Aristocrat and Zealous Conscript. Yeah. What a what a curve and what a combo. Yeah, yeah. That's First mom, damage, dad, and the Great Dane from yeah. the classic <laughs> joke. <laughs> so Smiter trades with the silver with Counter. the paladin. Okay. Yep. And we go champion of the parish, uh, cartel aristocrats. It's all sorts of stuff, kinds of crazy stuff going on on the back table, by the way. Uh, Makihito Mahara just played a, a Gideon Champion of Justice. You know what? I really want to see a lot of that Gideon, J Josh, that, that, that card. Josh Utter Layton played a Planar Kenzing yeah, it, against Ken Kenny Oberg. By the way, G Mahara's Gideon is currently at 10 loyalty. Wow. There's a Gore yep. Clan Rampager. Yep, and the Temple Garden tapped, and that's going to be back to Tom Martell, who, if he gets another land, he can definitely just go over the top of what Brian Kibble's got going. So I, have, uh, I don't think anyone would be surprised to see Kim off the top of playing uh, Tamiyo the Moon Sage. Oh, man, he, he could spot a control card like that from a <laughs> mile away. He's like, Tamiyo, four, please. Yeah. Well, I don't know he's playing four, right. but if he could, Tam he would. Tamiyo's uh, apparently at eight loyalty All right. going on over there. Right. Like I, wonder, I wonder if he has a um, ultimate plan. Yeah, and there's there's also a uh, dumb raid in play. So Planeswalkers are out in force in the feature match area everywhere but here. Yeah, not quite the battle of the Planeswalkers that, that it could be, but, you know, yeah. at least everyone's got one, except for here. Still a little bit of thinking for Tom Martell. He's doing some math. To keep with our Planeswalker theme, uh, Connie Woods had uh, Liliana in play, but and it got sent to detention. <laughs> okay, we're getting a little sacrifice action here. Since Kibler's at nine, Martel's really just trying to figure out how 
He can uh, finish off these last two points of damage, makes himself a flyer, and then uh, has protection pro red on the cartel. Pro red, pro green, one, one of those two. Gets in for two. That's two sure. damage, and that gives him a 1 1 flyer, which is going to get in a couple of more damage. Good. And gives him another, he plays another champion of the parish and gets his first, first. champion up to three. Brian Kevlar's at seven life. He's going to need to find an answer. He doesn't have a lot in his hand to work with. He has a boss Reckoner and a few land. So the Reckoner comes down. He's probably yep. going to be forced to play defense. Yep. Passes the turn, so let's see how much damage Tom Martell can force through this turn. I got to tell you, really, really Kevlar doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, he's, he's playing a very fair deck. Where's the crap? Yep. That's kind of his style, though. Yeah. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat hits the battlefield. It's a 4-1 with haste. It's going to fly over all of those creatures that Brian Kibble has on the ground. It's going to be very hard to kill. I mean, uh, we have a Tamiyo Ultimate from Guillaume Wafatapa. Now, that, that usually doesn't win the game. It but just, I mean, you know. I mean, it, it makes the game unwinnable for all, your opponent, all, all definitely. But. Okay. I will not block. So off the top was 1-0 over Conley Woods. That's true. So here's the attack in with the aristocrats. Yep. Despite being on the wrong side of uh, a Gideon, Gregor Patrick Meredith uh, somehow outraces it. How do you outrace Gideon with a bunch of creatures? Isn't that what you don't do? Yeah, yeah I, just I do it with a bunch of creatures. I, guess, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, guess, He's good. I mean, Gideon's good, but I guess there's only so Gerger's much you can better. do. Gerger's better. Gerger's better. Okay, so back to Kibler, the king. We're still in attack, I believe. Yeah. Well, I mean, Don't Tom Martell can make that a lethal, uh, a lethal Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Yeah, all he has to do is sacrifice one creature. One human. Yeah, one human. All, all the creatures. That's all he's got. Yeah. yeah, that's all he's got. He can sacrifice two to make sure the one's unblocked, that the cartel's unblockable. Oh, he, he's okay. already sacrificed one for that. Okay, so he's already done that. Cliff Topper treat your guy. And he shows him a couple of land. Yeah, I'll Cliff, trop, I'll cliff Topper treat your guy. Yeah, I don't think that's... So it sounds like it could do something, but it yeah, actually doesn't. Yeah. So Tom Martell leads 1-0 over Brian Protection Kipper. For uh oh, I got chilly. I'm trying to find a chest here. Yeah, my legs are <laughs> Which of these is a bigger problem? Nothing here is going on here. It's going to be pretty. <laughs> the camera's panned away. <laughs> no, what to see this? <laughs> Try this again. I can do this. Apparently, this we're, we're not a camera. There's a camera. We have other problems. Oh, yeah, then you <laughs> have <laughs> Wondering which guild is right for you? Take the guild quiz at guildsofravnica.com and then declare your allegiance to, on planeswalkerpoints.com to earn special badges and, achieve, and achievements. Talk to me about Simic. I need to know about Simic because I'm thinking, of, I like green and, yeah. and I'm not sure what I want to pair I can, it with. I can see you enjoying Simic. I, I've played, I've played a uh, blue-green madness in my day, you know, as far as... So that's as simic as I've it's gotten. It's not, not quite how it works here. Oh, it's not just blue and green cards? No, I mean, it's, you know, you're, I'm not, you're I'm not evolving. A, I'm not or... a creature scientist. Yeah, well, then this might not be for you. Okay, I'll, I'll stick with uh, Golgari. They do work well together, by the way. It's true. Someone decided to stick there you go, Brian <laughs> Kibler. One of the two. <laughs> All <laughs> laughs, even it in the face of defeat. Yeah. Being able to play Orzhov. Sharp leather sweet. jacket. It I fits just, very well. Just Sam deck. I need a jacket that fits energy, that well on me, but I don't know that they make them that more, round. <laughs> more <both>. so, <laughs> they don't come in that shape. <laughs> they don't come in that shape. Jackets don't come in my shape. To get something card. tailored. And there we get, it, get <laughs> look at um, <laughs> Tom Martell. Tom Martell, who, who's, I mean, just the last three, three, four years of Magic has just been, you know, on fire. Yeah, and he was actually starring in one of the uh, Walking the Plains episodes not too long ago. You know, I like to mention Walking the Plains. I like yeah. Walking the Plains. Yeah, of course. Do you, do you walk the Plains? I do. I walked the Plains to Philadelphia for my pre-release. I, uh, I hung out with those guys for the pre-release. We went to uh, Nick Costa's shop. And I was jealous. 
Went nope. to see a Nick game afterwards. Had a had a cheese steak at uh, Pat's King of Steaks. Not that much jealous. Not jealous of that part, but just that you were uh, having you delicious food. You and your Chicago beef, well, no, Italian no. beef. Well, I mean, it is pretty good. But I was at home, you know, recovering from oh, from yeah. childhood surgeries. Yeah. Oh yeah. How are you feeling? I'm feeling You're gonna great. You're going to talk a lot more this afternoon. You I know. know. I think I think my voice is a, a lot fuller now. And I was hoping that I would get a lot of, you know, you were looking for feedback more. on Twitter to say, hey, did you do something? Did you take voice lessons? You sound so much more sexier. That's what I was hoping, but it just didn't happen. Maybe now it happened. I'll, I'll be watching, let me turn on Twitter to see if anyone cares about me. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Rashad just recently went through uh, a tonsillectomy. Yeah, and adenoid. 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 And, oh, and, oh. Yeah, so they, they, just, they just scooped it all out. And if you, you know what? And now I'm going to be honest, the recovery was not great. And if I had to choose between that recovery and just getting sick three or four more times, it'd be hard. It wouldn't be an easy decision. I'd have to think about it. But I think I did the right thing, and I'm going to be more healthy well, we're, afterwards. We're, we're, we're glad you're feeling well enough to be with us here this weekend. Thank, and, thank you. And talk yeah, you know, and, and infinitely able to about magic. Yeah, because, you know, it, it, it actually interfered with a lot of events here. I would be here and I'd be sick and I'd work through it. But now I, I just, this is going to be a lot better. It's going to be better for you because I'm sure I got you sick a couple of times. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> I see these guys uh, shuffling up. They've gone through their sideboards. I got to tell you, every time we've seen the aristocrats stack go to their sideboard, we've seen uh, Obes at Ghost Council come in. Yeah. Um, there's a Blasphemous Act in yeah, the sideboard see. here, which it's seems like it might be pretty nice. I guess another creature based deck? I guess another creature based deck. Assuming yeah. he can, uh, you know, pick off the, uh, the what you call it, the Boros Reckoners in the other All ways. The other well, yeah. I guess they both trigger. If it's your turn, you yeah, you would die. <laughs> you die on your turn. So you'd have to somehow do it on their turn, which is very hard to do in this format. Well, shockingly play first. So as far as sideboard goes for Brian Kibler's deck, let, you know what? Let's talk a little bit more about Brian Kibler's deck because, you know, we mentioned it. We see that it's Naya. We know he's going to be playing Naya, or Green White, or Green Red, or something around that. It, it, it is very much a Domri Raid deck. You know, he's got four Domri Raids in his deck. And then is it just all creatures? He's got five, five, nine. 10, it might be easier to, to count the non -creatures. everything, yeah. You know, so, three Mizium Mortars, that's it. <laughs> Three Mizium Mortars and a bunch of creatures. Yeah. <laughs> and four Domi Rage and then, yeah, everything else. Uh, apparently, this is uh, maybe a deck that was inspired by uh, Tomahara Saito, who's yeah. just been throwing, you know, rippling stones into the yeah. pool of uh, the he, format for, for a week. Yeah, he's definitely been assembling a lot of Gruel decks. And I have to think that, is, is he Gruel? Did he, did he pick Gruel? I don't know, but I think, but he, he must have with all the Gruel decks he was throwing out there. Okay, so let's... How do you sideboard if you are Brian Kibler, Hall of Famer well, Brian Kibler? What are you, what are I, you doing? I think he's certainly bringing in Thundermore Hellkite. Okay. Uh, could be bringing in his Aurelio uh, War Leader. So it looks like we've got a quick keep. We may yeah. have a little bit of yeah. time needed for the hands to get updated, so we're not going to show that just yet. But uh, we'll do our best to tell you what we see in their hands so that you aren't totally left out of the loop. Yep. So we have Rootbound Crag for Brian Kevler versus a Champion of the Parish and tapped from a, looks like a Goblet Strike. Tom Mattel's at 18. So Arbor Elf comes down, second turn for Brian Kevler, which right now doesn't have a target. A lot of times there's just no forest for your Arbor Elf. You play Arbor Elf, you just don't have a forest, so it's just a 1-1. One -one. It's just there to trade. It's, it's just there to block a Champion of the Parish. So here we go. We get a look at uh, what Brian Kibler's playing. And there's yeah. the du there's a dummy raid right there. No forests in sight. Couple more arbor elves though. But hey, we're gonna be able to cast that Boros Reckoner. Maybe yeah. that's all we need: Boros Reckoner or dummy raid. A lot of a lot of options over there for Brian Kibler. Tom Martell says go. He says, looks like he played a Sacred Foundry untapped. And pass the turn with two mana up. Another one. Yep. And there's a second Arbor Elf, and we're going to swing with the first. Yeah. Well, let's see what could be in Brian Kibler's hand. I mean, in uh, Tom Martell's hand. Yeah, looks like there's an Orzhov charm that he just drew. So that's the card that we're able to cast. 
And he decides not to. Sure. Here comes Boros Reckoner. Not sure what the creature type was, but it's definitely one of the creature types yeah. of Min Boros Minotaur Reckoner. or Wizard. How do you beat a, a Guillaume Waffle Tapa? Uh, I would slaughter games them naming Sphinx's Revelation. And to start. you know what? And you would have one sad Guillaume Waffle Tapa because. And, and one happy Conley Woods? Yes. That's exactly what happened. So we'll see if that's the, the game breaker to, to force that to a game three. We'll keep you up to date on what's going on there. But again, that match. Oh, and there was one in Guillaume's hand. Oh, he was, I'm for sure the, he was just the, waiting. For the Goocher. Oh, man. The minus one card immediately. Brian Kibble plays a Sacred Foundry untapped, and there's a Boros Reckoner of his own. Leaving a mana up, most likely to get first strike. Right? And, and the situation we, we described earlier is, is coming up because there is a Blasphemous Act in Tom Martell's hand, we can oh. see. There's a couple of Blasphemous Acts. Well, I mean, how oh. could you have the Aristocrats <laughs> deck without a Blasphemous <laughs> Act? <laughs> To sip my water after that one. I'm sure all you kids aren't familiar with that joke, but don't go ask your parents. Don't do it. That classic. It's a, charming, it's a charming Disney classic. Well, it's got some charm to it. <laughs> that, I wouldn't, I would, <laughs> the, uh, I wouldn't call it charming. It's the says, Boros version of this, the Aristocats. <laughs> I will build an Aristocats deck. So it sounds like there's a dummy raid so, with about seven or, or, counters Orzov on it. Charm takes out the, the uh, Reckoner. And, and really, Martell's looking to get Kibler down to 13 here. Well, Tom Martell's at 13 right now. Yeah. So, so we're definitely at the point where Tom Martell is not going to be able to blast this nope. act if Brian Kibler has a Boros Reckoner in play. But as long as he keeps those Reckoners off the board, it becomes a win condition. Soon. Soon enough. I have three. Kibble has three cards in hand. Dami Raid, Restoration Angel, and another Cliff Trap Retreat. Sure. So Knight of Infinity comes down. That's going to give Exalted to the Bowls Reckoner as long as... Maybe. Maybe. Yep. We'll find out soon enough. And it did. Looks like Josh Utterlayton is um, flexing his control muscles over against Kenny Oberg. He has a triple drown yard action going on. Triple active drown yard action. Uh, Three drown yards and the mana to use all of them. So he is. Large and in charge, unless, you know, Kenny Oberg has a couple of um, elixirs of immortality just waiting in the wings. 16 lands, that's enough to do it. Kibler still contemplating what he can do. I wonder if he smells the Blasphemous Act coming. <laughs> do, do you think he... These, now, these are two players that, you know, have worked together, and it's possible that they know what each but, other but not. But they're, they're on... Different teams. Yes, they are right onto some different teams. But you know, again, you've also played near each other. You've right. also seen how some of the other matches have played out. Yeah, and probably, your teammate, has a yeah. probably has a reasonable idea of what's going on. There's three mana. Looks like a Domri it is raid. The Domri raid, yeah. And there is Domri raid. Yep. And he's the plus one. Looks at the top card. It's not a creature. Goes back. Plays a Sacred Foundry tap and passes the turn. Here you take a look at Domi Raid. Awesome. <laughs> so, Gerger Patrick Maradich wins his match 2 nil over Mahara. Yeah, I, I guess Gideon isn't enough to keep to keep Gerger off the yeah. off, off your heels. He is very aggressive and very gruel. Awesome. A 
lot of thinking yet again. This board is starting to get a little clogged up, and Domery Raid is kind of sitting there going, hey, if you don't deal with me. Yeah, cl clogged up means that Blasphemous Act is getting cheaper and cheaper to cast, and if, and if, if, if Tom Martell casts the Blasphemous Act right now, he wins. That is correct. So he's got to be considering that. He's trying to... Do you think he doesn't want to, you know, signal that that's his plan? Do you think... I mean, how, how, how do you, what do you do? Do you just I mean, play more creatures? He wants it just to be a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Mm -hmm. So there's an attack with the Boils Reckoner and no block. So Brian Kipler is going to go down to eight. Uh, seven, right? It is seven. It is seven. The exotic trigger. There's a land, and there is the Blasphemous Act. So, this this is gonna do it. That's the game. Tom Martell wins two games to zero. He got to the punchline. <laughs> what do you call that? They're all like arbor elves, no forests. Like they just they just flood out. Yeah, that was me last round. I mean, like my my opening hand was uh, retreat, retreat. Uh, Resto, elf. retreat, retreat, re yeah, retreat, retreat, resto, elf, uh, Donry or no, Crag, and, uh, and and reckoner. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean you can't mulligan. Yeah, I mean like you I'm draw, not gonna, if you draw a forest, your hand's awesome. Well, I mean if I if I draw any land that isn't like doesn't come into play, tap my right. turn to at least play reckoner, and then like you know it's like all right, well I have so I'm like my hand obviously not. Right. Just give us thirty seconds. We've been listening to uh, Brian Kibble and Tom Martell just kind of banter about the, the choice and, yep. you know, talking about sort of some of the speculation you need to do when you're keeping a hand and, you know, how sort of not having a, a forest or a forest card hurt him there. But Tom's like, yeah, you have to keep that because if you do draw a forest, right. it's going to be insane. Exactly. And you know what? Sometimes your your one ones for one are just one ones for one. I think we're going to have to now. deal with it. The, no, they're coming it's over great here. that the meta in this in this standard environment is is so colorful and so easy to do whatever you want, but sometimes RBLs don't do all those. We, we're getting a uh, we're gonna get a look up. Looking to face a greater challenge? Take your game to a Grand Prix and see how you fare against the best players in your region, as well as top visiting Magic pros. Upcoming Grand Prix include Quebec City, Charlotte, Yokohama, Verona, Yurtik, and San Diego. For more information, visit wizards.com slash Grand Prix. I'm sure I messed you up. I think I tasted player one. Did I change the name? So no, we're getting right. a look right now at know, Conley I, Woods I, I versus Guillaume Wafatapa. So I, I know a lot of people at home have been okay. clamoring to see Guillaume Wafatapa in action. And there is a signing blood. It looks like that signing blood was pointed at Wafatapa's well, face. Well, certainly the, the extort trigger is pointed okay. at his face. Okay, so, the, so we're yeah. not at that point in the game. We're not at that point in the game yet. But, uh, you know, it looks like yeah, I just saw Dreadbore, a Tameo, an extort. Uh, you see, the Pith and Needle hmm. is on oh God, Drown Yard, I believe. That's I, be Godless I believe I heard that a little bit earlier from Tim Willoughby. And there's. Right. Not yeah. And we got an attack from the Nighthawk. Is it both of them? And there is Grizzlebrand wow. with enough mana to extort. He's like, you know that card's as good as Sphinx's Revelation? I concede. <laughs> That's basically just Sphinx's Revelation. That can attack me for seven. So that match is tied at one apiece. Yeah, and uh, they go back to their sideboards. So let's take a look at what these two players are actually the playing. Sphinx's Revelation. And... <laughs> Talk about it a little bit and see what kind of adjustments they've probably already made or can make for I mean, game three. Yeah, I think so. Can I make one of those? No, I don't have one of those. Uh, we have Dave Humphreys. I said earlier, going to be on the uh, 
in the in the desk, but actually he's on the live chat. So if you uh, if you hop yeah, that's on, that's quite a treat. Quite yeah. a treat. So if you hop on there and you want to actually interact with Dave Humphreys, yep. you should you should go uh, and do that right yep. now. Yep. So just go to dailymtg.com, click on the coverage for Pro Tour Gate Crash. There's going to be a link there for Cover It Live. That's how you interact. That's how you ask questions to David Humphreys, mm -hmm. and you know have a great time. And you know mm -hmm. and you can do that while you're watching the stream. So it's all awesome. It's all there on dailymtg.com. So, so looking at uh, Waffle Top of Cyborg, oh, I can already yeah, yeah, tell you yeah. that he brought in Blind Obedience because we saw it in play. Yes. And I gotta get the lands. Uh, uh, oh, almost certainly, uh, you know, looking at the mm -hmm. sideboards here, it we sounds do. like Guillaume Waffle Top. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, well, you're gonna see Witch Bane Orb coming in way, after yeah, those slaughter good, games uh, were so. Uh, oh yeah, that's so a, pivotal. That's a sweet one. And, and, and Witch Bane Orb is not a card that Conley has a way to interact with. No, not at all. And because he's black and it's an artifact. <laughs> well, he has some red. Yeah. You never know. He may have a card or two that can deal with an artifact. And uh, no. he has one Rakdos charm. Oh, Rakdos he does. charm oh, can good. deal with an artifact. That's, I don't know that that's the oh, plan oh, yes, to yes, bring yes. in your one rack was trying to get rid of Rich Fangs or okay. but <laughs> And it's interesting that they both cost four mana and the fact that Waffle Top is going to be able to play this game. That he can actually play it before the slot, the first slaughter game oh, actually correct. comes down. And uh, and, and also the Rector Storm is also actually pretty nice against something like Snapcaster Mage. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, where Guillaume can oh, use okay. his uh, Nefali Drown Yards to fuel his graveyard mm -hmm. at er, you know, early in the game. And uh, you know, then in a sense, to essentially draw cards right. uh, from a uh, Snapcaster Mage. Right. So now oh, yeah, yeah. we saw yeah. we saw Colin Woods play this deck last round, and he was playing against a you know a Jundish Farseeky kind of mid rangey deck. And now this is this is more of a dedicated control deck that he's going up against. And I'm looking at his sideboard, and I know these three directions are definitely in in his. Yeah, oh, 50, absolutely, right absolutely. Now. We think the Rakdos Charm, probably yeah, just, another just Liliana the Veil, and something. almost certain we know the Pithy Needle. Yeah, yeah we saw, saw the Pithy Needle. Yeah. And uh, especially when, when you sit down and you play against Guillaume Waffle Top, even if you play him and he doesn't cast a spell game one, and you know you win game one, and you look at your sideboard, you know you're taking out your creature, your, your creature removal in favor of things that are going to give you an edge against a control deck. And that's usually what happens when you know you're the mono black deck, and you're you have to switch to defeating control decks rather than defeating creature decks. You have to go well. We gotta go lighter on the creature removal and a lot heavier on the give me that card out of your hand, give me that key card out of your deck, give me all the cards out of your hand. Uh, tri tribute to hunger from uh, Guillaume. I can see just seems like it'd be terrific. I mean, I can imagine there's a lot of points where. There's just, yeah, just, just a Gristle Brand in play. Yeah. Or even if there's two creatures, you get the Snapcaster Mage and cast it again. Game yeah. four life kill two of your opponent's creatures. That's. Uh, here's a card. Did you have Psychic Strike on your list of constructed playables for? Of course I did. <laughs> you know what? I've actually seen Psychic Strike in some deck lists, but. Yeah. It's not coming in this matchup. No, it's not coming it's in this matchup. But it's but it's it's there. It's there yeah. if Guillaume meets it. No, yeah. no, 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 it's the same, same just colors, in case. Uh, it's more of a mirror card. What a mirror. I'm thinking what's called. All right, so now we're looking at yeah. our opening yeah. seven and Guillaume Wafatapa all foil as, as usual. usual. Yeah. As one does. It's a very pretty hand. A lot of them also Japanese slash Korean slash non. None of them are in English. The prettiest okay. card available. Lands. Yeah, it's got a couple lands. Got a lot of two drops. So Sorry's so charm gets you to more lands. So yep. They both keep. Yep, they both keep, and we lead off with a glacial fortress tap for Guillaume Wafatapa. and a swamp for Collie Woods. Second Glacier Forcers comes in tapped. Guillaume has to really love the fact that he's getting so much time against Collie Woods. And there's a duress from Collie Woods that's going to... See, Drown Yard, Snapcaster, Azorius Charm, Sphinx's Revelation, Snapcaster Mage, and Dissipate. Now, I don't know if Collie had that in his opening 
panned. Right. Uh, but if he did, why would he wait till turn two to to cast a dress? Is there something specifically that get a, get get have Guillaume draw another card? Yeah. Is there something specifically that he's looking for? Maybe the the hit that could cost three that he just doesn't want to see. I mean, I mean, maybe you know he's thinking about something and go which Bane are, but you know. Huh? We don't know what he saw if, if Guillaume had uh, drowned yarded himself. Mm-hmm. Just just get a bigger range of cards. You know, just one more card, one more shot at getting something good. Yeah. There's another come to play tap land for Guillaume off the top. But he's been doing this for a while. Yeah. Playing his land tapped. <laughs> we don't need to use him right away. Oh, and there's nope. a backbreaking underworld dreams. Like in the control in the control matchups, that card is just brutal. Yeah, that, that Underworld match. Connections. Yeah. Underworld Connections, sorry. Right. And that duress was well timed because he was able to check to see if there was anything that can foil the resolving of that enchantment. And Guillaume you know, Wafatapa only gets one more draw step to, to to get something that it can actually counter it, and he didn't. So now there's going to be this endless stream of cards for, well, not endless, just yeah. you can only draw 20 more until it's over. And here comes Slaughter Games. Does it resolve? It usually does. It's hard to counter that one. That's a card that is very, very, very difficult to counter. So here comes Snapcaster Mage targeting Azorius Charm. Okay. I'm, I'm curious as to what's, what's happening next. Whoa. Oh, he just wanted to get the <laughs> Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, well, because he named Sphinx's Revelation and that. hit three Sphinx's Revelations. Wow. That was more this counter, is the hand that. All right, all right. That Waffle is. Toppa had it and as the slaughter as he knows slaughter games <laughs> is gonna resolve. Now how many of these did he actually see from that duress? There were only two in his hand at the time at the duress? I, I believe there so. There had to have been at least two. I right? know, I think there might have only been one. Really? Wow. Yeah, I think he drew drew. That's unfortunate. Or yeah. fortunate, depending on which side yeah. of the table you're sitting on, who you're rooting for. This also gives Kali was the opportunity oh, to see yeah. if there are any changes so in sideboard. We were talking about his, uh, like, that he could know that there's something like a Witch Bane Orb. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he knows there could be a Witch Bane Orb, because... He slaughter game. He slaughter game them before, so... Right. And, and we don't know for sure that it's in there, but it seems likely. Right. So now, Guillaume Wafatafu is just down to a Dissipate and a Defalia's Drown Yard. But he's also going to draw a card off of that. Yeah, he's going to draw one card off the Azorius Charm. But he's really not going to have the ability to just refill his hand. No. Because, I mean, all those Sphinx's revelations are just gone. Yeah. And there's nothing else in Standard that's just like that. I tell you, Conley Woods is making Slaughter Games look good. I think a lot of people knew how good Slaughter Games was and being able to take out Sphinx's revelations is just what you want to do. Thractus is like a close second of annoying cards. Like, I just need that card to not resolve just to get it out of the, out of the picture. So there's the Azorius Charm. Flashback to draw a card. And... Waffletoppa well, isn't working with a lot, but he's going to get in for two with the, with the Snapcaster Mage. They drew an ultimate price, it looks like. And Conley goes to work with the connections. Yeah. Let's take a look at his hand. Yeah, yeah well, I, there it is. Double Girls of Brand, Deathroar, Dreadroar, Rakdos is returning, and other slot games, just just for the rub ends. Says, can I have Liliana, or do you want to dissipate this? Ooh, is it on the table? It's he's just tired of holding it in his hand. This is heavy. Uh, so it does get snap yep. snap a pated? Is yeah. that a thing? Sure, absolutely. Snap a pated. Thirteen. Now Guillaume gets to attack for four, so he's the beat down. He really doesn't have a lot of options mm -hmm. other than to try to just win the game oh. as fast as possible. Especially with Conley was drawing an extra card each turn with Underworld connections. Against the Dreadmoor Snapcaster Mage. One Snapcaster Mage down and a pass of the turn. Guillaume's going to probably draw a card from this Azorius charm. Yep. Draws another Dissipate. Maybe he'll be able to protect this, this beatdown plan <laughs> that he's got going. He has a Dissipate in his hand, and he also has an ultimate price to get any creature out of the way. Nine. 
back to Connolly Woods, and there is a Vampire Nighthawk. And there's that ultimate price. I've never seen Guillaume Wafatapa in this mode before. <laughs> just, just toss it. Is that oh, divination? Is that, that is divination. Oh, is this just, is this protection from Slaughter Games? No, he, that's a main deck card for him, it looks like. Yeah, he has one main deck divination. One divination. And he just drew a Jace Memory Adept, which is actually a card of, a source of card drawing. Six. But take a look at, like, look at that hand in Conley's The Woods gas got. in Conley's hand. It's got a Crypt Gas, two Girls of Red, a yep. Duress, a Rakdos' Return. The, uh, the Slaughter, Slaughter Games draws a Dissipate from four. Guillaume. Conley's down to four. I think that was the Rakdos' Return that got dissipated. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course yeah. it was. Of course games, it was, wasn't very it? difficult. Yeah, very yeah, difficult yeah. To you, you could try. Of course it was. There is Mem uh, Jace Memory Adept, and looks like it resolves, and we're deciding if we want to plus one or a mill for ten. Just one. Looks like, okay, so we are the plus one. Guillaume draws a card. Collie Woods mills a card. We can't see quite what it is. And Guillaume also has to think twice. I think this is the most amount of cards I've seen drawn after a Slaughter Games has taken out all of the Sphinx's revelations. <laughs> Me too. I mean, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have counted them out. I shouldn't have said, you know what? Guillaume Wafatafa is going to be able to draw cards after, after the Slaughter Games. That was foolish of me. If anyone can do it, this man can. Duress hits think twice. Cryptcast. Go. Flashback think twice. Draws another Hollow Fountain to go with a second Jace Memory Adept. So that's going to stay in Guillaume off the top of his hand for a little while. Oh, sounds like we have the indestructible mode of Boros Charm from Kenny Oberg. I think that uh, was that was following the four, four to the your face yeah. mode of Boros Charm. But he used it. He used it to let a Geist of Saint Trap live through a Supreme Burner. Oh man, that's that's a good thing to do. You oh, want, are you all tapped out? Guess what I'm going to do? Smash. Uh, I tell you, I would uh, definitely attack into that Crypt Cast. <laughs> I th I'm pretty sure that's on the list of things to do. Because Colleen Woods is at four life. Guillaume Wolf Thomas at a healthy 18. He has a Jace going. He's got, he's drawing an extra card of turn. He just drew a Azorius Charm. He's got protection. He's got protection against any attacks that Colleen Woods can do. Let alone having just 18 life to, to finish this game off. <coughs> In comes the Snapcast Amage, no block, so Colleen Woods goes down to two. There we get a look at Jace Memory Adept. And here comes two mana, and there's a Zorius Charm to draw a card. And it's a Devour Flesh. Oh, that is Devour Flesh. I've got a four. So Devour Flesh gets rid of the Crypt Gas. And makes Three. that Snapcaster Mage lethal. Well, it, it's not lethal yet. Probably was goes down to three. One card? And, and possibly two. If he decides to draw another card. The mana short of... Oh, and there is the Staff in it, which... It's an answer. Yeah, it's going to shoot that Snapcaster Mage. It's going to give another card every turn. But now, how close yep. are we to seeing a Jace Memory Adept win? Here comes 10 off the top, or the 3 off the top, from a Drown Yard. We're definitely in Plan B mode, <laughs> where, where Plan A was beat down, and now Plan B is, let's see if we can mill him. 
Yep, let me count your library, please. It's well over 30. Okay. Well over 30 cards. That's a lot of cards. And speaking of getting decked, sounds like Joshua the Utter Layton is got a little over 10 cards left in his library in his match against Kenny Oberg. Here goes the first 10 card activation. Hmm, he's thinking about the Underworld Connections yeah. activation. He's like, eh. so And he says, why not? So he goes down to two. He's going to draw extra cards from staff on them. He's going to swap. He's got the Nothing mana for points. Bristlebrand. Now, does it resolve? Now, we know that there's nothing in Gion Wafatapa's hand that can interact with that, but yeah. how... There's his hand right there. Yeah. How sure is, is Kali Woods? I guess it doesn't matter. He's just going to throw it out Throw it out there. Just comes Oop. off the top rope. Drown Yard activation. Get the three cards. Jace is going to get ten more, presumably, on the next turn. Jace is at six counters. One away from that ultimate, which would just end the game. Just draw, I'm sure there's not 20 cards left in Collingwood's deck right now. Just mill 10 more with Jace and Memory Adept. One, two, three, four, five, seven. six, seven, seven. Seven cards left in Collingwood's so deck. Conley has to be on the kill Jace plan, uh, but we know. That there's another one. Yeah. You're at, what are you at? Sorry. 18, 18. Uh, shoot you. Will, will Conley have the, the prescience to Slaughter Games naming Jace? Jace. Memory Adept? You never know. It would be a grand play. There's also a Rakdos' return right there that he could use as an expel to get rid of uh, the off the top of his hand. That's enough with the Drown Yard might just be able to finish him in time. Yeah, that's definitely true as well. Drawn two at Dry Yard activations in next game. Because Stefan Nim, I don't believe, is optional. I think you just draw that extra card. How do you get out of this if you're calling me? How do you do it? Uh, does he have a pithing needle that he brought in, or uh, yeah, maybe pithing needle? He has a pithing needle. Pithing needle, drown yard. He has to look. I don't, we don't know if it's in his graveyard right now, yeah. but if it's still in his deck, he needs to draw a card to try to find it. Yeah. That's the best answer. Just the pithing needle, the drown yard, and then kill the Jace Memory Adept. But he doesn't know that there's another Jace Memory Adept. This is our last match in the feature match area. Josh Adelaide just won 2 0 over Kenny Ober. But this is a pretty good match right here. No, I'm really excited about how this is played out. I'm really curious if there's a pith and needle in Collingwood's graveyard. Maybe uh, Tim Willoughby can take a look at the graveyard and let us know. Right, he needs to, like, basically what he needs to do is he needs the pithing needle, drown him. He needs to attack Jace right. and kill it and slaughter games Jace. Yeah. Well, he can also just use Rakdos' return or Rakdos to return. kill the Jace that's oh. in play and get rid of all oh, the other cards too. in his hand. There's and not there a pithing no, in his graveyard. So it's either still in his sideboard or I can't imagine. It's, it's, in his, it's one of those six, seven cards in his deck. In, in the deck tech, he talked about the fact that he has that card specifically for cards like Drown Yard that he can't interact with. So it's, it's definitely, it's got to be. It's almost certainly in there. But this is, you, you're really put in a position where you're about to get decked. You have the opportunity, you can draw one more card and just make the Drown Yard that's sitting on the other side of the table immediately, immediately lethal. Right. And you know what? I don't think it even matters because if he, even if he activates and he gets the Pitha Needle, he can, there's a, he can respond with one activation that's going to get rid of three cards. Right, and, and keep, keep in mind that, you know, Slaughter Games versus... Definitely uh, to one. Rectus Rectus return. Return. He's got to worry about counter match. Yeah, one of them can be countered. If there's a Snapcaster Mage or a Dissipate or... And I think it's pretty it's pretty difficult to actually put your opponent on having a second Jason's Memory Deck and playing, you know, 
Okay, I'm going to... Uh, you have to put them on a two-card hand of Jace dissipate here. Yeah, exactly. And it, that's just not something you can do. If you want to get rid of both the Jace and the cards in his hand, the play is Rakdos' return. Yeah, yeah, I could do this for seven, shoot you twice and this, but put you to one. I guess I that's it. He just, oh, okay. he just gives up. He can't do it. He, he shows all the guy. things he can do, and it's just not enough. You can put him down to one. Oh, he, there was a pithing needle. I guess it was uh, still in his deck. Yeah, the pithing needle was still in, but that's it. Guillaume off the top squeezes this one out. That was insane. One, two, one. This, this was sweet. I oh. hope for everyone out there that was worth the wait. My game one is not Everyone was talking about Guillaume off the top. For now. A little bit of beatdown, a little bit of control. Um, that was a game. It was a match. It was a sweet match. There were definitely ways that Conley Woods could just have this miracle comeback to win this game. And the fact that Guillaume Waffle Top was playing beatdown with a couple of Snapcaster mages, that's, that doesn't happen. Right. And it really all came down to that one sideboard Pithy Needle. Because I think if he draws that Pithy Needle, he can play it. Exactly. He can attack Jace. Yeah. He can, he can uh, slaughter games instead of having Arakdos return there. And have the time to have but, needs. But instead, the game just ended in the regular way instead of something super, super exciting. But it was very, very... Sus uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great game. It was a great game. But that's enough of us gushing over awesome games of Magic. We'll let the news desk take it over and give you like the real feel of what's going on. The numbers. The raw numbers. So, see you guys later. Hey, and welcome back to the news desk. My name is Marshall Sutcliffe, and I'm going to be going over a couple of the scores, and then we're going to have a deck tech with Zach Hill and David Sharfman. So first off, Eric Froelich, he has improved to 6-0. He 3-0'd the draft, and he's 3-0'd standard as well. So off to a great start for Team Channel Fireball. From him, Melissa DeTora, she's also 6-0. I think she's actually listed at number one on the leaderboard. You can see here, there's also uh, Paul Rennie. He is also at 6-0, along with Timothy Simonot. Now, going down the list, we have Robert Yurkovich. He's improved to 5-1. Tom Martell, you just saw him on camera. He is now 5-1 as well. Uh, and Andrew Cuneo is at 4-2. Shi Tian Lee is at 4-2. And, and Paul Rietzel also at 4-2. Okay. What we want to do right now is show you another deck tech. These things are great. This standard format is looking really sweet. So why don't we send it right now over to Zach Hill with David Sharfman for a deck tech. Hi, welcome to the Tournament Center. This is Zach Hill with Pro Tour Nagoya champion David Sharfman. Thank you. Uh, David, you're playing a deck called Lucky Charms. Now, yep. it looks a lot like some of the other blue, white, red decks we've seen. Tell us just in a couple of sentences exactly what does your deck do? Um, it's a blue, white, red, mid rangey controlled, or it's a, a mid rangey deck sure. that you want to just play a few creatures out that will block and buy you time until you play a big spell. And that's basically it with some removal mixed in on the way, so. Sounds pretty straightforward. Let's uh, take a look at a few of the specific cards in the deck. Now, the deck's called Lucky Charms. One right. of the reasons for that is that you play 10 different charms. That's a lot of charms. Yeah. If you just walk us through this, uh, why is Azoria's Charm so good in this deck? Uh, Azoria's Charm is definitely the best charm in the deck. Uh, oh, yeah. All three modes are very commonly used. With uh, the different creatures in the deck, being able to give lifelink when you have two of them in play is huge against the very popularized red decks. Sure. Um, it's always live because you can always just cycle it. And then I would say the most used mode is the attacking and blocking. Of course. Uh, which in my mid-range control deck is exactly what I want to be doing, is buying time. Exactly. And we see a lot of Azorius Charm in deck. Like, this is just a really, really good card. You can always cycle it if you yep. need to. card we don't frequently see in blue-white red decks or blue-white red flash decks is Boros Charm. You're playing four. Yep. Now, why are you playing four Boros Charms? Um, in this current format, there's a lot of uh, Planeswalkers that happen to go up right. to four loyalty, which you can use the four damage to a player to get rid of them. Um, there's currently a lot of removal in the format. You can make them indestructible. Um, it's a very versatile card, like most of the charms are. Uh, the double strike isn't quite used as much. And also with Boros Charm, there's a very neat combo that I'll explain later. But yeah, it has uh, a lot of uses, like the rest of the charms. Yeah, I see a lot of people siding in, like Jace Memory Adept, for yeah. example, in this card, just for two mana. Yeah. It just totally kills Against Jund, it kills Liliana, it kills right. Garrick, kills Jace. Uh, does everything you want it to. And then with a Snapcaster Mage, you can actually 
kill them very, very easily. Right, just like, like for you, Snapcaster, yeah. for you, attack. Right, and that's, that's a, a very easy path to victory. Seems pretty sick. And finally, you got two Is It Charms. Which of these modes do you use the most with this card? Um, it'd definitely be the counter a non-creature spell and two damage. Right. I would say two damage is like the biggest draw to the card. Uh, the format's very aggressive right now, with right. a lot of just bears that you can always kill. And then against the other mid-range and control decks, like being able to counter Rakdos's return, a Planeswalker, right. another Sphinx's Revelation, it's just awesome. And then uh, the draw to this card too, you only really use when you're behind, sure. um, which is a nice thing to have on a card to help you get back into a, a winning position. Right. Now you were talking about aggressive decks and decks with a lot of bears. I want to take a look at the next slide. Now, you got uh, some cards that are quite excellent against yep. just random 2-2 two -two creatures. Uh, four copies of Augur Bliss. I think this is in many ways kind of the core of a lot of the decks you see that are just based around like cheap instants. Right. Uh, why, why, are, why is this good enough to build a deck around? Um, this, Augur is actually one of my uh, favorite cards in the deck just because I love value creatures. <laughs> um, being, able to, yeah, being able to just get a free 1-3 like mm -hmm. against a format full of bears is exactly what you want to be doing. Um, yeah, and the other nice thing about Augur and the rest of the creatures we'll get to is like the come into play effects, you can keep on reusing these value creatures and eventually gain like incremental values just slowly over time until you just take over the game. For sure. I mean, okay, so we've got Snapcaster. We don't really need to talk about why yeah. Snapcaster Mage is good. Uh, I don't think anyone's played Standard without playing against Restoration Angel. Right. Of course, it's really nice to be able to buy all these ETB effects, but I want to get to the really cool part of the deck which is actually the next slide. Now, yeah. we've seen this card all over the place. It's kind of one of the defining cards of the format. Yeah. But your deck does something pretty sweet with Boros Reckoner. Can you walk us through that? Right. Well, on his own, he is obviously one of the best magic cards they've printed in quite some time. Just and and I, th I think that statement, I think we all understand that, but explain exactly yeah. why he's so good right now. Well, with the, uh, the 10 charms I have in the deck, <laughs> there is a... A kind of infinite combo that you can uh, pull off with the blue white charm, the Azorius charm, you give him lifelink. So with his damage dealing ability, he has lifelink. With the Boros charm, you give him uh, indestructibility so he can't be killed. And then with Is It Charm or attacking and blocking or any one of the other burn spells, if he's dealt damage, uh, you can deal the damage to target creature or player, which doesn't say not himself. So you target <laughs> himself again. So with the lifelink, you gain whatever life you target him with, two damage, let's say, from his charm, and then you can target himself again. So you gain two more life, and you can do this an infinite number of times and gain infinite life, which oh, wow. a lot of people won't see coming. Right, and then after you're done with that, you can still just deal that damage to some other target right, exactly. after you gain infinite life. Yeah, and then you deal him two damage, you're at infinite. You, he still sticks around through this combo because he's indestructible, and you're in the same position, but you have infinite life, and a lot of decks in the format cannot deal with infinite life. Can't be different life. No, sure. totally. And uh, in addition to all of that, now obviously like you're not going to have the combo in hand all the time. Right. And nevertheless, Boros Reckoner was just one of the most in-demand cards at this tournament. Yeah. Why is he so good right now? Is it just that powerful of a card? It's that powerful of a card and the mana bases they're printing right now lets him just fit into any deck and be cast so easily. Oh, yeah. And a three mana 3-3 three, three that your opponent cannot attack into. Like, yeah, yeah it's just a great magic card. <laughs> Now, and we've, of course, got Sphinx's Revelation, one of the format's most powerful cards. Matt Costa was telling me one of the reasons he liked playing these, like, blue-white-red mid-range decks or flash decks is because they had better Sphinx's Revelations than a lot of the other control decks. Do, do you agree with that? And if I, so, why? I agree with that just because the amount of uh, aggressive creatures in the deck, like Restoration oh, Angel sure. and Reckoner, your opponent has to, like, in the mid-range mirrors, they have to, like, tap out to deal with your guys so you can actually get this off and, like not have to worry about falling back behind. Right. You can do it while you're ahead, basically. Yeah, and you don't necessarily have to like chain a revelation into another Correct. revelation just to stay alive. Yeah, off this, you a lot of the times draw like a couple Boros charms, a Snapcaster, and then you're just, they're actually just <laughs> dead when they go to do theirs. That's awesome. All right, so we've looked at the core of the deck. Now we kind of just have a, a random assortment of cards. <laughs> now one unsummoned, two pillar of flame, three spear, two supreme verdict. You don't arrive at those numbers accidentally. How did we get to this point? Um, Basically, you only really want one unsummon, especially oh, yeah. with the Snapcasters and Augur Bullets. Uh, two just becomes too many. It doesn't really right. do much. But when it does something, it is awesome. And a lot of it's like such an underplay card that your opponent will not see it coming. It's hard to play around it. And if they are playing around it, okay, well, you only have one. So, like, 
you might just not have it. Right, and in the uh, the new set with the Evolve mechanic, like with oh, Experimental shoot. 1, Champion of the Paris, all these plus one, plus one counter cards, like a lot of the times a burn spell won't be able to kill them right. where Unsummon deals with that problem card, I guess. Totally. Now, sometimes you do need to cast burn spells. Are these right. just for the aggro decks in the format? Uh, these are just mainly geared towards the aggro decks. Like, uh, with the Boros Charms, you can sometimes use them against the mid range decks to actually burn them out, but they're in my deck just for the aggro decks. Totally makes sense. And I imagine Supreme Verdict, yeah, I mean, you, you need to kill creatures, you need to kill creatures. Right. There's actually, um, uh -huh. about this card, a lot of lists on uh, that other people are playing has Blasphemous Act, right. which is a cool combo with Reckoner also to deal 13 damage. Of course. But in the testing I did, like, Boros Reckoner is such a popular card that you cannot cast it. Oh, you can't act their Boros Right, Reckoners. you can't do it when they have one because it, since Blasphemous Act is a sorcery, and if you both have them in play, your ability is going to stack first and then theirs. So you're going to take 13 first. Oh, that's crazy. Yep, so that that's did not rough. work out. So that's why I'm playing Supreme Verdict over Blasphemous Act. Cool. All right, so of course, you've got to be able to actually cast all of these spells. Do that. We've got the Ravnica lands. We've seen them before. They're very good. They define the format. Uh, we've also got the lands from M10 and Innistrad, if we can take a look at the next slide. We actually just run the full 12 copies of this. Is that like something that's normal? Um, yeah, a lot of decks in the format have 10 of the uh, shock lands, like two of one of them, and then four of the others, and then 12 of these. Just because yeah. you don't want to play all 12 shock lands because you're taking way too right. much damage in exactly. such an aggressive format. Yeah, these lands are just perfect. Cool. And uh, finally, the last couple of lands we can take a look at. We've got uh, basic lands, basic lands, Slayer Stronghold. Now, you see a lot of Moreland haunts in this slot. Why Stronghold? Um, basically because I do not, I don't have Thought Scour, I don't have a way to get creatures in my graveyard, oh, okay. and there's only like 14 of them. So I felt like Slayer Stronghold was just, with like Augur Bolas, like all right. these like random dorky creatures you have, it just lets you get through and deal more damage. Yeah, you just turn them into a threat. All right, let's take a look at the sideboard very quickly. Four Geist, one Thunderbolt. Now Geist used to be a staple of the main deck. Why is it a sideboard card now? Uh, it doesn't get three Boros Reckoner. <laughs> like, that's basically it. Uh, there's four of these, there's four Boros Reckoner's main deck. They're good in different matchups. Sure. That's basically it. And so you basically bring this in just yeah, when just Reckoner a, a straight swap. Cool. And Hellkite, is it just another creature? Uh, yeah, it's another creature. It deals with Planeswalkers. It's good Second. against Lingering Souls, which the deck actually has, surprisingly has a problem with. Cool. Yeah, All right. Just, if we can uh, look at the next ones now, is this your anti-control package, yep. Jason the Gate? Um, Basically, yeah, with uh, me being so aggressive, I can afford to play Jace when they're tapped low. Totally. And kill them very easily and negate, obviously. Right, they have to wrath your board, you just play a Jace, yep. and suddenly the game can end. Yeah, all right. and just catch all. Cool, and now we finally just uh, got a lot of more assorted cards. Yeah. Purify the Grave, Searing Spear, Is It Charm, Detention Sphere. This is obviously for graveyard decks. This is something you want more removal. I've got one question just about Is It Charm. It's kind of a versatile card, which you don't see in sideboards a lot. Right. Why is this here? Um, there was two negates main deck, or there's uh -huh. two negates in the sideboard. Right. I didn't want a third, just because it's, I don't want to have that many cards for control right. decks, where Is It Charm, you can board in. It's like a spell pierce. Yeah, it's a spell pierce. It's also one of the best cards against Jun, just to counter like Liliana, kills Huntmaster. Totally. So, yeah, just a, it's just a very versatile card. Cool. And finally, Detention Sphere. You said you had an issue with Lingering Souls. Any yeah. other matchups? Um, yeah, just, it's just a, another catch-all. And like a Pro Tour, there's so many unexpected decks that you want to have cards that are just good against permanent. Totally, because you so, may not know what's happening. Right, you don't know what's happening, yes, and that's yes. just the perfect card for what you want. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, David. Again, yep. Pro Tour Nagoya champion David Sharpman here with uh, Lucky Charms. Mm -hmm. I'm Zach Hill, and this is the Tournament Center. Let's get you back to more Magic the Gathering. Hey everybody, welcome back to the News Desk. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, this is Zach Hill. You and I were in the booth earlier. We're at the News Desk now, and we're gonna bring you a little bit of news, and we're gonna talk some cards. First things first, uh, a couple updates from the score tables that we've been looking at. Larson improves to 6-0, and that's Joel Larson. Uh, a quick update on that, so he's still undefeated yeah. too. One of the few left, we're gonna start transitioning over to actual full leaderboards, but we wanted to keep this, this uh, little storyline going that we've got for, for the day. Um, Kelvin Chu, four and two, so he drops down to, to four and two. Stanislav Sivka, the winner of the last Pro Tour, right. is sitting at five and one. Now, we're in the standard rounds at this point, Zach, and uh, what we want to do is start taking a look at some of the cards that are in standard that we see here this weekend right. and some of the ones that uh, you might be seeing next weekend, for example, at uh, Grand Prix uh, Quebec City. If you're not seeing it, you might be playing it. That's uh, right. Depending on what does well this week. <laughs> That's right. So the first one we have to look at here is Abrupt Decay. Now, it's a card that we haven't seen a ton of recently. Right. 
talk about this a little bit. So one of the reasons we're spotlighting Abrupt Decay is that it's an extremely good answer to the breakout card of the tournament, which is Boros Reckoner. Yeah. Abrupt Decay gets rid of that while also still being very powerful against Liliana, against Detention Sphere. You know, it doesn't just hit creatures. Right. And, um, you know, there's very good control decks in this format and very good aggro decks. So having removal that does something against the matchups where you don't really need a creature kill spell, right. really, really valuable. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's take a look at the next card here. We have Arbor Elf. Now, we have seen a few Arbor Elves out there. Um, oh, you know, yeah. Naya is interested in Arbor, totally. although I think Avacyn's Pilgrim kind of takes the, the, the front seat to that. Talk to us a little bit about Arbor Elf. Well, Arbor Elf is interesting because it's actually harder than it would be a lot of times to cast. We've seen a lot of mana bases that are like, uh, you know, Rootbound Crags, the M10 yes. lands, and then the Innistrad lands to sort of mirror those. Uh, if you have 12 of those, you don't always have Forest for your Arbor Elf. Because it requires a f an actual an forest, actual forest. Which, which can also be one of the shock lands, which is interesting. Yeah, exactly. But you don't always have that. A either. temple garden or a stomping ground or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But, you know, it, the thing is, like, the Lana War Elf type cards, whether it's Lana War Elf, Boreal Druid, Fendhorn Elf, Noble Hierarch, Arbor Elf, Absence Pilgrim, your one mana accelerant's always going to be very good. Uh huh. Um, and you know, and, and that, is this, one of those. this format's no exception. Yeah, exactly. All right, next we have a card that we have seen quite a bit today Augur of Bolas. So, Augur of Bolas, uh, a two drop that can go into control or kind of a tempo control deck. Why don't you talk to us about how this fits into the format? Yeah, so uh, we heard from David Sharfman. He actually wanted to play his deck because he loved Augur, Augur of Bolas so much. You know, <laughs> yeah. He says it's a value creature. It's just, you know, you tap two mana. If you're playing a deck with 24, 25 instants, you're almost always going to see one, you're going to hit, and you're going to be up a card. Right. The other thing is this format is very aggressive. There's a lot of one mana, two power creatures. You know, we're not seeing a lot of grave crawlers. We are we're seeing a lot of champions of the parish. We're seeing Rakdos Cacklers. Uh, we're seeing uh, Stromkirk Nobles out of the mono red decks, uh, even Ash Zealots. Augur of Bullis blocks all of those uh -huh. on top of giving you a removal spell to kill more guys. Yeah. Against control decks, he's a body he, you can sacrifice him to Liliana, or you can equip him with something like Rune Channer's Pike and make him lethal very fast. So it's just an all around versatile card yeah, that puts you for, ahead for early. the low, low cost of two mana. Right, Next, exactly. we have Azorius Charm. Now, Azorius Charm, we've seen quite a bit of here today. Like, Basically, all of the decks that are capable of running that type of yeah. mana seem to be running. I want you to talk to us about Azorius Charm. Well, again, I mean, like we were talking about, it's a removal spell that's not just a removal spell. Uh, it makes your mana base better because you can play fewer lands because you can always just cycle an Azorius Charm to draw a card. Mm -hmm. uh, cycling, just pay two mana, cast it, draw a card right. if you need another land or you need something else. But uh, the, the put an attack or a blocker on the top or bottom, obviously really good if you're playing defense, can be good proactively too, just to make your opponent draw a redundant spell. And then as we saw again from David Sharfman's deck tech, so there's an infinite combo. Yeah, that it's was super life. interesting. I actually hadn't considered that. And since I was, you and I were doing the draft coverage, I hadn't seen it on camera or anything like that either. Really sick. Yeah, and again, the way it works, if you give a Boros Reckoner lifelink. Mm -hmm. and with you, this. With, yeah, for, right, with Zorius. For example. Then you make it indestructible, and then you deal damage to it. You gain infinite life all of a sudden. Yeah. So, or, or unboundedly high life. Yes. So that's uh, a little known use of a card that was already, you know, again, 14 standard Grand Prix top eights. It was really a pushed card when we made the set. Card we knew it was good, turns out it's even better. Yeah. Uh, next card we have is Champion of the Parish. Now, you mentioned him a little bit earlier as, uh, you know, kind of an aggressive one drop. How does right. it fit in? Well, I mean, it's just one of the most powerful things you can do in the format. It's a one mana creature that can easily become a 3 3 or a 4 4. Very it's quickly, too. Extremely quickly. I mean, A, there's just a lot of humans. B, you can always do something like Gather the Townsfolk. But even if you're not doing that, I mean, we've seen blue white human decks with wing crafters. We see uh, white green human decks with silver blade paladins and rankers. We see uh, the Team Star City, who I played a little bit with. Uh, Sam Black made three different decks with this guy and Cartel. Aristocrat. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, everything from Boros Elite to Falkenrath Aristocrat that you're seeing right now in black, white, red. So, I mean, it, you don't have to work very hard to make Champion the Parish good because most of the best creatures in the format are humans anyway. I mean, a Huntmaster in the Fell. Sure. So, I mean, you know, it's a one mana 3-3. Three, three. Sometimes it can get even bigger than that. Very powerful card. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our next card. We have Detention Sphere. Now, it's interesting that Detention Sphere exists in the same space that Oblivion Ring yeah. does. 
Which one do you think is preferable? Well, it's it's a really challenging question. I've seen a lot of players who are playing blue-white actually still playing Oblivion Ring. Uh, Detention Sphere, obviously very, very good against Lingering Souls. Great against your opponent's best draws, because often your best draws involve like multiple copies of the same really good card. Mm -hmm. uh, so Detention Sphere, Sphere obviously shines there. You want Oblivion Ring, though, um, to target your opponent's Detention Sphere. Yeah, that's one clause about Detention Sphere is that it doesn't hit other ones. I think that, you know, in R&D, they didn't want to have this one-upping game, and there's some weird loopholes yeah, that we've exactly. seen. So, so this kind of closes yeah, all of those. Yeah, we just didn't want to worry about that. Yeah. Now, the other reason you might want an Oblivion Ring, let's say you have four Boros Reckoners, and your opponent has four Boros Reckoners. Uh, if you play yours, you play his. Sometimes you want to Oblivion Ring your opponents and start attacking. You can't actually do that with a Detention Sphere because it exiles yours as well. Right. So uh, kind of a weird interaction, but uh, there's definitely reasons to play Sphere, definitely reasons to play O-Ring. You're going to see a lot of them either way. All right, so I am told that we are ready to go back down to the feature yeah. match area, so why don't we head down there right now here from Montreal, Pro Tour Gate Crash. Hi and welcome back. It's now round seven of Pro Tour Gate Crash here in Montreal, Canada. I'm Tim Willoughby, here with Brian David Marshall. We'll be going down to the feature match area very, very shortly. They've had some fantastic rounds already and we're going to see kind of almost a rematch of one of the matches that we saw earlier on on camera. Yeah, we, we saw the uh, the Prime Speaker Zagana deck, Prime Prime Minister of Panic, I think they're calling the deck, uh, as Shahar Shenhar playing that deck uh, versus Ralph Levy, who we saw the last time, playing the Bant deck with Wolf Run. Uh, I Have guess we got a name for that deck yet? We, we've been calling it Wolf, Wolf Run Rant. I like it. <laughs> the Wolf Run, of course, very, very important in that control deck, giving it a lot of reach. Yeah, uh, absolutely, which is exactly what we saw happen uh, against, I, I believe it was against Adam Yurchik. Yes. And he was able to just push through and over the top of uh, all of Adam's creatures. And just force his way in for lethal damage. So, Yeah, these control decks now having an awful lot more creatures in play. They're able to be a little bit more aggressive than perhaps the, uh, the control decks of old. Yeah, well, I mean, creatures creatures are where it's at, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, Restoration Angels and, and uh, you know, uh, Thrag Tusks and Rakdos Cacklers and Flinthoof Boars and... Even, even, yeah. the, even the Centaur Healers, that little bit of life gain and the 3-3 body, very efficient body, and that extra life gain, really important too. Yeah. You've, uh, you've been watching a lot of... You've been watching a lot of magic uh, in the spotting for the last yeah. couple of rounds in the feature match area. What's the deck you've been most excited about? I'm, I must admit, I'm a big fan of Conley Woods' deck. Um, <laughs> Black by popular demand, it's it's got a lot of things going for it that I really like. It's it's able to take, take control in a different way to a lot of the other decks that are being played in the room. Sounds so, like sounds like we get to see some magic. I, I think so. Let's let's go down to the table and see if we can find out what's going on there. We've got Raphael Levy against Shahar Shenhar. Let's let's move across right this moment. <laughs> 